We, we, we are live. All right. I, <laughs> I'm just going to keep setting things up in the background while yeah, we're live. No problem. And I will be glad to uh, say people's names and say hello to them. Oh, what ions are present in an ion tail? Man. It feels Wait, like what a, happened to you? Uh, uh, no, Richard Drum asked, uh, wondered what kinds of ions are in the ion tail of a comet. Uh, sodium. I know sodium is an answer. Yeah. Carbon monoxide, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide. There you go. Hey, everybody. Now's your chance. Say hello. Uh, and I will say hello to you. <laughs> Is that the way to pose a question? You got to put a little question mark. You're close. Richard. And apologies to everyone on Twitch for the chaos. I am I'm the one simulcasting this week. And I I was hit by a you must install updates when I got to my computer and F updates sometimes. Yeah, people. my computer uh yeah, completely rebooted last night, which I hate. Yeah. I hate having my computer update on me without my express permission because exactly i've got some very specific things that i need done could we all fit could we fix itunes what's wrong with itunes uh is something wrong with itunes uh is our podcast feed having issues probably i don't know let me see Mm, see, it looks like it's the most recent one. Maybe it, there's only 300. So it's the older episodes. Is that the problem that you're having, um, David? Because there's only, you know, we're up to episode 569. There's only 300 episodes on iTunes. We can't fix that. So that's yeah. something that Apple does. They actually cut off the length of your shows, but... The actual episodes are all still in the podcast feed, but you have to pull it directly. So you may require a different podcatching software, or um, you can go to our website and you can download all of the episodes that you don't have, the older ones that you don't have. But but if you're using Apple's program, then you are kind of boned. So, and and we're. Um... We're in the process of some staffing changes, and I've been handling, um, along with awesome help from Nancy Graziano, I've been handling uploading everything for Astronomy Cast the past yeah. couple of weeks, and I may have screwed something up. Um, so please, if you I, hit any issues, just let me know. I mean, I don't think so. I mean, you can look. Let me. Let me just. I can look right at the feed. Uh, okay. But I know that um, that that iTunes does a 300 episode limit okay um uh, let me see let me go to the very end of the rss feed oh it's so gigantic <laughs> uh no actually it is cut yeah the end of the rss feed goes to episode 168 so there's a lot of other so so we were back in the olden days, I was maintaining the astronomy cast feed manually. And we were just editing a text editor for this exact reason that the, um, the, the length of the feed is, ah, oh, that feels like that's the Libsyn one. That's, that's wrong. Huh. So, so the issue that we ran into is Libsyn has a limited number of megabytes that can go in their feed. Yes, yeah, so we're forwarding to the Libsyn one. There's your problem. And okay. if well, so the the issue I ran into is when I went back to self hosting with yeah. yours. Yeah. I uh, it was costing me two hundred dollars a month just for the transfer of that file back and forth. Um. um so I hit a data cap right. that I was exceeding, and hmm. 
Um, it took us from costing 15 a month for hosting to several hundred a month for hosting because of the one super long file. Yeah, so so we should be able to work around that. So I'm using, um, well, I know we're using Libsyn. I'm using Fireside Media right now, and I pay $20 a month for all of my episodes on for universe so, today. So find out if there's a megabyte cap on how much there's, you can have in your RSS. So so Fireside will only host um a, they'll only host a fraction of mine as well. So it's so it's the yeah. same. So I need to ask them to f like what will it take? But what you can do is you can break it up into two chunks and i see oh, a lot of people doing this so they since yeah. they create two they create the the new version and then they create an archive version which is it's it's a terrible method like you just want to have them all available and you just want right. to be able to go through as old of the old you know as far back I'll, through them i'll as you talk want. to the folks up at Lipson. i mean this has got to be a problem 10 years later that a lot of their podcasters oh, yeah, are yeah. having and i'll talk so, to the fireside people as well and see if they yeah. will if they'll support it and then you know if we have to we could shift astronomy cast over to fireside because i think like you should be able to you should be able to join a podcast and go through all of their episodes and pull all the back issues, right? right? Like, you know, maybe in the future we'll, you know, if you make it pay only or whatever, like they do with say hardcore history, it totally makes sense that you, but yeah. for us, we want all our episodes always available and we don't exactly. want a hassle. So. so, so here's a question for you coming in from Tropical Tom. When you are one day living inside your robot body, will you allow automatic updates? Well, you have to, I think. I mean, you you want to check. You want to you want to maybe instantiate a second version of yourself and then run the update on that second version, and then one of you is going to have to decide which one to commit suicide. But apart from that, sure, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you need the updates. Well, so that's where the automatic update comes in, the mm -hmm. forcible reboot when you least expect it, like Zoom just did to me. Um, I got to say hello to some people. Hello to Andrew Planet, Astro YYZ, Bora Klankar, Bruce Bushy, Chris Bamford, David Reynolds, uh, David Swift, Dustin King, Dustin Reichwin, Elad Avron, Eric Schneider, Harry M., Janelle Duncan, John Seffield, Leonard Lindstrom, Maria Kobitz, Nancy Graziano, CycleCat749, Richard Drum, R. Jones, Sergusi, the Half Blind Astronomer, and Zafan Zafan. Hey, everybody. And I'm sure some others of you said hello, but we sort of blabbed for a second. So before we go into. Um, this today's episode of astronomy cast did did i show you some of the pictures that we took during the last virtual star party yet no on sunday i want to see oh they're so good okay hold on let me see if i can find them here. i'm sad how late at night you're doing those mr i live in the pacific yeah, time I zone i know i know i know all right so let me see if i can share this here and that's with the audience and then that's with you so that's Corey's image of jupiter that we had in the in the star party so can you see that okay okay yeah yeah so that's pretty great you know it's a nice yeah. you know, jupiter clearly you know you can see it's captured from a video camera so it's good um uh hold on a second here all right so back to me should they should be popping up is that gonna do it okay all right so we got this one, which is, of course, good old Saturn. Why isn't it? Hmm. All right. Oh, there we go. Okay, good. All right. So Saturn, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, check that out. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> isn't that amazing? That's sweet. That's super sweet. Yeah. The moon. Unbelievable. It just like it yeah. looks like it's from a spacecraft, but no, this is just this is from Corey's telescope in South Africa, viewing the moon, uh, seen uh, just over the you know right against the Terminator, and it's a stunning image. So, um, excellent. Yeah, yeah, so great, so great. But yeah, no, absolutely. They, I mean, like uh, the the fact that the Earth is a ball sucks and <laughs> it would be like wouldn't it be so much more convenient if it was flat then we wouldn't have yeah. the time zones in the same way that we do things would be a, a lot um a lot smoother so how, uh, how do flat earthers explain the southern versus northern hemisphere stars they don't they have no okay. answer for that okay yeah 
Yeah. And reality, of course, is that, I mean, even even like they say that you got the sun and the, and the moon and they're like little balls that are floating above the flat plane. But the reality is, is that the sun would never go down. Right. You would always see the sun. Like it's not like it's not like the fact that the sun just because the sun is farther away from you, if you've got a direct line of sight to the sun. Uh, that's what you see. So. So, yeah, people are asking. So those are. Yeah. So Corey stacked up those images. And so those are essentially those are the post production images that that Corey took from the star party. Um, but but still, it's a absolutely stunning uh, experience. It was it was it was so good. Um, and then, of course, speaking of of comets, uh, Mike, do I have them here? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Good. So, speaking of comets, so here, let me share this one here with you. Um, so, Dave Dickinson showed up, and so I was able to show off Comet Pan Stars. Ooh. Yeah. So I was able to get that, and that's just a straight up thirty second shot that we took. Whoa. For 30 seconds, that kind of rock. Yeah, I know. This telescope is so fast. It's, it's, I'll show you some more 30, 30 second to 60. I think. Is this, he at prime focus? It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, um, whoa, my computer's freaking out. Okay. I can't help with that. All right. So we got, uh, the great globular cluster in Hercules. <laughs> We've got, um, M51. 51. Yeah, and again, that's one minute. Um, we've got M, I think that's 101. Um, it could be. I yeah, can't see enough yeah. of it. Uh, no, that's M101. That might be 80. Oh, you're right. Yeah, you're right. that might be 83. Um, we got, we've got the Owl Nebula. I love that one. Yeah, yeah. we got the Snowball Nebula. That one I know nothing and about, think, and it oh, looks like nothing. Yeah, and the, uh, the um, Sombrero cool yeah very cool yeah so we we had a great time and and this is i mean literally this is this is just back with the new system new operation still uh still just learning to make this work but i think hopefully you know we now that so it's it it's funny nancy's got nancy graziano's got a little time on her hands and she was like okay i'm gonna take over the virtual star parties i'm gonna make them awesome and so each week I've been working with Nancy and uh, uh, Ben Kalo has been helping us develop some of the look and feel of things. So uh, hopefully eventually we're going to have a map. So you can see where all the different uh, astronomers are located. We're going to show off the different gear that they've all got. And so we're going to try and make it like almost like a like you're watching a sports ball game. But but it's with telescopes. So anyway, so. I want to turn, I accidentally left my overhead lights on mm -hmm. as well as all of my spotlights. Mm -hmm. And I currently look like a vampire. <laughs> I, I'm going to stand okay. up for a moment and go turn off a light. Okay, no problem. Um, anyway, so we're going to be doing just for, well, Pamela does this just to let you all know, we're going to do another episode of the Virtual Star Party on Sunday night. We'll try to make a bunch of improvements. We'll see what's up. Um, have some more guests, maybe, hopefully. Uh, also, <clears throat> on Sunday, and I haven't put this up yet, um, I'm going to be interviewing Sir Martin Rees, who is uh, a, I'm not sure that's an improvement. Oh, there we go. Okay, your, your, your camera just had to figure that out. She can't hear what I'm saying. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be interviewing uh, Sir Martin Rees, who is, of course, the Astronomer Royal in England. He he lives forever. Yes, I know, I know, and 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 is hilarious and yeah. very thoughtful, and both has opinions, as I said, astronomical and existential. So, um, yes. we will be able to have a conversation about uh, both really fascinating ideas in astronomy, as well as the fact that all humanity is doomed. So, uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So, I will put up the event, and that's going to be on my channel on Sunday. We're going to be talking around. Uh, let me see. You will be talking. I think yeah, I'm just going to give you a time. Uh, 10 30 a.m. on Sunday. So, okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Let's. I, I, <laughs> I remember not being like wondering how you're going to spend all this time in your, in your quarantine. Man, I have just been so busy in the last uh, week. 
The been... the answer is we're going to create all the content to keep <laughs> everyone from getting bored. Yeah, this exactly. This is what we're yeah. doing. Yeah. Yeah, no time. I don't have time to worry about uh, the apocalypse. I'm not canceling the apocalypse. I'm just going to ignore the apocalypse. All right. I approve of that. It seems like a healthier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. More of that, please. All right. So if you're wondering what it is that you've stumbled into, we are going to be uh, recording an episode of Astronomy Cast. Today, we're going to be talking about discovering comets and teach you how you can get your name on a comet. So uh, we will take about 25 minutes or so to do the episode, and then we will stick around and answer your questions about space and or astronomy. Oh, why? I don't know why. What are you struggling with? Oh, uh, Audacity crashed on me, but it recovered my <laughs> my shows which is okay good. okay okay all right i'm gonna put a new one all right so i'm going to press record i have pressed record and it is recording me too all right yay let us celebrate here we go astronomy cast episode 570 discovering comets Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Great. Uh, full on paradise is back here on the west oh, coast really? of, uh, of Canada. Uh, everything is growing like crazy. I can't weed fast enough to keep up with the with the new plants coming in i have that that yes yeah yes i i put uh eight buck eight garbage pails out filled with yard waste for the garbage trucks to come and take away oh it's, geez it's it's just madness yeah yeah and it's just it's beautiful like every every winter you're like oh it'll never it's just like it just looks like such a horror show and then boy come may everything is just paradise again i love it out here i i did plant my peas too early and they have little frost tinged leaves for the ones that didn't get uh underneath my cold frame fast enough oh weird we we can plant our peas here um january and that and that's like you, you pretty much can't plant them early enough january is fine february is wow fine. yeah and then that's the perfect timing because they like to be cold and then they come up and then they're yeah we actually have a very mild climate here on vancouver island compared to what you have so oh yeah well and and you started your peas outside i started mine inside and they were like wait wait we don't like it out here why did you do this to us <laughs> yeah no no we you you always start them outside here you don't you're it's crazy you're wasting your time you just dump you dump a mountain of peas into the ground uh and they are popping by by march you start to get fresh peas off them by like April. I didn't plant any this year. You know, we've we've shifted everything to flowers because somebody uh, <laughs> likes flowers and hates uh, hates peas. Although peas make flowers. Anyway. Peas do make flowers. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, let's get on to it. So discovering comets is one of the fields that amateurs can still make a regular contribution to astronomy. But more and more telescopes are getting more and more telescopes. Ugh. Let me do this intro again. <laughs> Discovering comets is one of the fields that amateurs can still make a regular contribution to astronomy, but more and more comets are getting found by spacecraft, automated systems, and machine learning. This week, we'll talk about how comets are discovered and how you can get your name on one. Uh, have you ever tried to be, uh, have you ever tried to discover a comet? Very briefly in graduate school, and then the fact that I had to do graduate school work stopped that plan. Yeah. So, so how did how did that work? You're like, man, I want my name on a comet. Um, well, it was the Soho data, and so not oh, everyone so was getting their date. names. Yeah. Yeah, but it was just the I want to be the first one. It's it's like you see people who on threads and forums were like first, and that's all they want to do is. <laughs> Right. This was the comet equivalent of this because I just have to do everything nerdier. Um, so I just wanted to be able to say first on an image of a comet in Soho data. 
so, all right. So for, I mean, we've done episodes, whole episodes on comets. We've talked about many things, but for anyone who, I guess, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to say like, you don't like, don't, don't explain what a comet is, but explain, <laughs> explain enough. Cause that like, come on, like this is baby's <laughs> first astronomy cast. Like let's, you know, let's bring things forward a little bit here, but at least let's talk about the, the features of comets as it relate to how and where we see them and find them. Okay, so comets are small bodies in our solar system that when you apply enough heat, grow a cloudy coma around them and a tail of debris that is getting pushed back away from them by the solar wind. Their orbits tend to be a lot more elliptical than the orbits of asteroids. And so we often initially categorize something as asteroid or comet based on its orbit, because when you find a comet far enough out, you can't tell what its future may be. Um, but really, the only difference between an asteroid and a comet is the ratio of things that melt and things that don't at right. inner solar system temperatures. And we have those two varieties of comets. We have the, the short period and we have the long period comets. And, and I'd say that we actually have three because we also have, well, Inter comets stellar. from others. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure. We need to add that in sure. now. But they behave like uh, a long period comet. And so I guess exactly. with the short period comets, they go around and around and around and they don't get that far away from the sun and they appear on a regular basis. Right. But I mean, that can be Halley's Comet, like once every yeah. 70, 70 some odd years. Yeah, years you see this thing flare back up again and again and again, while yeah. the long periods, we're seeing them for the first time ever, and chances are they've right. never been to the inner solar system. So then, and, oh, go ahead. And there's a really good chance that a lot of prior uh, long period comets that we saw were actually interstellar, and we just didn't know it because we didn't stop to think about it. And we weren't that good at making our like doing our observations to to measure that that orbit as carefully as maybe well, astronomers now are. We also talked in the past about how comets had hyperbolic and parabolic orbits. We didn't really think that through. <laughs> right, I see. And so, yeah. So so you're yeah. saying that there could and almost certainly have been long period comets seen in the past that yes. came from other star systems, and we just went, oh, yeah, it's a long period comet, so it must have come from right. the Oort cloud. And exactly. No one, right, and no one ever said, wait a minute, that's like the longest period comet. Yeah, that is super funny. Because if that wasn't the case, why were we teaching undergrads that long period comets can have parabolic and hyperbolic orbits and you only see them once? Because really, that describes an interstellar orbit. So, did, did nobody ever like say, well, like, wait a minute. Okay, so a comet can have a hyperbolic orbit. You know, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, you know, yes, Pamela. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it possible that they came from other star systems? You know, like, yeah. it seems like a conversation that someone would have, would have brought up. But anyway, so when can we start to notice a comet as it's entering the, the solar system? Well, they're generally quite tiny and most objects aren't found any further out than Jupiter's orbit. Hmm. But once something is in a Jupiter orbit sized sphere and comets come from every single direction, folks. Right. Uh, once they start to be within that sphere, their motions across the sky are zippy enough that we start to be able to see the motion from image to image. And they start to be close enough that one of moderate size can show up moving from image to image. Further out, you, you're dealing with two separate things hindering you. They're further away, so they appear fainter. They appear smaller. They may not appear at all because of their size. And the other thing that you're dealing with is further out, they're moving more slowly through the sky. And if you're just doing a whole group of images, you may not notice that one of those dots has actually moved a little bit. I think it's pretty interesting. I mean, we've talked about how how difficult it has been to find Kuiper Belt objects. and. Yeah. And a big part of it is that astronomers were only scanning the region of the sky where you would expect to see planetary 
objects, you know, in, in the plane of the ecliptic. And that's actually a very small chunk of the sky. And so they take these really powerful telescopes and slowly scan little bits of the sky. But the sky is, is in all directions. And these comets can come out of all directions. So it's not surprising that something that, that would have been detectable weeks, maybe even months earlier, you don't find until it is getting bright enough that you just can't miss it. And I think that's part of the what's great about the game, the hunt of of comet finding is that exactly. everyone, nobody can look in all places at once. Therefore, we've all got a shot at finding the comets before anyone else and getting your name on it. And, and that's the cool thing is federally nationally, academically, uh, no matter where in the world you may be, there's limited resources. And if you're a lucky nation, you have three or four big surveys that are out there looking through the sky, but they're each looking at one particular chunk of sky and they optimize those chunks usually to look for things that are about to smack into us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's helpful. That is a completely reasonable use of resources. And they also often optimize for the places that have the highest likelihood of having objects. So you want to look sunward because sunward, if an asteroid or a comet is coming at us from the direction of the sun, it's probably going to get missed by everyone else. And it will have probably just gotten, well, it's orbit bent. So we may not have known what it was doing before that, that really, that's where the death is most likely to come from is the horizon. Right. as the sun sets. Right. Now, beyond that, you want to optimize for the plane of the planets that cut through our solar system where most things orbit. And the reason you optimize for that is because that's where most things orbit. Right. And so and you're going to get but, those short period comets and you're going to get some of those long period comets. And, and you're still not going to get all the long period comets. And this has to do with the origins of these objects because many of them got flung into the inner solar system through some sort of a collision, a three body interaction where you have three objects gravitationally interacting with each other and fling one in towards the inner solar system. Or if you have two similarly sized objects trying to orbit around each other loosely in the outer solar system where the sun is the third body, you can also have that kick something into the inner solar system. Right. You, you have Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, all bouncing things around with their periodically and these interactions don't demand that things end up flung in the plane of the planets right right um so so then let's talk about the methods that are currently used to detect comets um how do we find them today well the the way that you find them if you want to put your name on them yes please <laughs> is you pick yourself out a nice region of the sky that isn't too cluttered because you like yourself and that is away from the plane of the solar system because that's probably being searched by somebody else. And you just sit there taking image after image after image and you look for something to move. Now, the thing is your images don't have to be taken moments apart. So when I say sit there, what I actually mean is if you want to be super efficient about this is you image this one, you image this one, you image this one, then you repeat. So you have a grid of images, mm -hmm. a grid of places on the sky, and you just march through that grid. And then when you process them, you look for things that move. Now, if you want to have pretty pictures, whether or not there's a comet in them or not, you can make the finding the comet a little bit more difficult by uh, having your telescope track at the rate that stars move in the sky. Now, if you want to make it easier to find comets on very particular orbits, then you figure out what is the typical speed of a comet through the sky. Now, this doesn't work for comets nearly as nicely as it works for asteroids. If you want to find an asteroid, best way you can discover an asteroid is to point at the asteroid belt, track your telescope at a typical asteroid belt velocity, 
and you're good to go, you're probably right. going to find something. And so then the stars are going to cause trails, but any dots in your picture, those are going to be asteroids. Now, the problem with comets and why this can work in particular cases, people trying to find Kuiper Belt objects, this is what they do. Uh, if you're a comet, you could be moving on any path through that image that is vaguely around the sun in the correct direction. Even then, you can still get comets that are going the reverse way around the solar system. So this may not work. Yeah. But it's a technique. Right. <laughs> really, the best thing you can do is just track with the stars and hope for a comet. Right. But, uh, but I mean, like for your average amateur with a, you know, they've got a reasonable telescope. Maybe they've got an eight-inch Dobsonian telescope. Yeah. They know how to use it. They, they, they know the sky very well and you you just look into the sky and slowly scan across the sky bit by bit mm -hmm. and looking for anything that's a blur or a smear and then yeah. you and then you consult your your gut your your guide your messier object list and, and literally this is the purpose <laughs> of the messier yes. object right yeah is is to see whether that's a thing and if it's a thing then you ignore it and if it's not a thing that you that is familiar then you yeah. figure out if there's if there should be anything in that spot in space and if there's not then maybe you've discovered a comet and then you come follow up and you do follow-up observations and you try to get much better pictures of it and then maybe try to track its movements and announce it and and here the the full step needs to be find something fuzzy-ish if you're determined to find a comet it needs to be kind of fuzzy mm -hmm. make sure that sucker moves if it's not moving you may have just found yourself a galaxy if it's not moving and not particularly fuzzy and not in your map you may have just found a supernova which is also yeah. cool um so so if it's brand new not moving you may have found a supernova if it's brand new, is moving, you may have found a comet or an asteroid. And then if it is moving, you report it to the Minor Planet Center and they figure out, is this actually new? Are you actually the first person? And if you are, kudos, it's yours. Now, yeah. the catch is to do this step, you really need to have, before you even have started, gotten yourself an observatory code from the Minor Planet Center. So this doesn't fall into the how you find it. It falls into the how you get credit for it. Right. So you can find things all you want, but you're not going to get credit unless you're, well, official. Yeah. And then, and then, but if you are the first, then you get to put your name on it. Often though, astronomers find these things on the same night. And so they have to share the name. And that's how you get examples exactly. of things like Chir Chiriamov Gerasimenko. It's yes. two different astronomers or Shoemaker Levy, two yes. different astronomers on the same name of the comet. Okay, so that's the amateur that's working, toiling away night after night, scanning the sky, knowing it like the back of their hand and searching for these things. But of course, beep boop, let's make computers do this. <laughs> um, so how have computers really taken over the process of comet hunting? Well, and this is something that, that I have backburnered writing software to, to do even more of this. You take two images, you subtract them from each other. And the reality is the sky from night to night, it changes. So when you subtract two images, it's never perfect. You're always going to get left with something ugly that has donuts that are the residuals of one of the images. But you can tell your software, if it looks like this ugly donut, ignore it. If you have a perfectly dark, dark spot, that means that in one of your images, you had an object. If you have right. a perfectly bright spot, that means in the other of your images, you had an object. So you subtract images. And quite often what they'll actually do is average a whole bunch of images to get even better signal to noise. Then subtract that mastered image from the entire set and then you just step through and hopefully you'll see something moving along now worst case is you see something in one and only one image as it escapes from your field of view that's frustrating
that just means you found something super close that you may never be able to find again and you don't get to right. name that. But but it's not just the, you know, the process of actually looking through the images. It's the actual telescopes themselves are robotic now. Oh, yeah. Yes. And, and so you can set up a survey scope. And a lot of people do this not to do surveys for comets, but they'll set up their telescope before they go to bed to go image their favorite objects. Variable star astronomers do this so that they can check for all possible nova that might be going off that so that they can get better timelines for the series of variable stars that they're studying. And so you program your telescope before you go to bed to take a series of images. Now, if you're doing variable stars, if you're doing uh, pretty much anything that requires you to know how bright something is, you want to use a filter. You don't even have to do that if you're just searching for asteroids or comet. Just let all the light right. hit your detector, all the light into your detector. And um, yeah, I mean, if you don't want to make pretty astrophotos, then let all the light into your detector and let all the stars just blow out. Don't worry about it. The faint fuzzies will show up and then you can follow up and make other observations. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the and what's great about the modern software is you can just you can program your your telescope and say, sh you know, m look at this, then look at this, look at this, you can just program in your whole night's observations. The moment the sun goes down, your telescope goes to work, it's working all night long, beep, 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 just just scanning the sky and then crunching all the data in the morning, you get up and look through it. Now, now, what about, um, you know, interesting astronomers like pan stars, or people like that? Who are these people? Well, PanSTARS is just a automated survey that some federal program paid for. Uh, a lot of these are honestly funded through a combination of NSF, NASA, private foundations, donations. And these systems, so you have Linear, you have PanSTARS, you have SWAN. Uh, these different systems are automated images. And with Linear and PanSTARS, their software is going to pull these things out just night after yep. night after night. No human intervention required. You don't get credit. Yeah, PanSTARS. That's why it's not like, you know, why it's not like the same comment. Like PanSTARS is back. No, 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 no. It's a brand new PanSTARS. PanSTARS, <laughs> PanSTARS is hogging. PanSTARS, as you said, swan. Uh, I think there's Atlas. There's a bunch of these that are all just hogging the comet discoveries now. But comet swans, there, there's a bunch of these. <laughs> uh, the the one that we're dealing with right now is C2020 F8 swan. Yeah, the and comet in that case, swan. Yes, and these they they stand for the Solar Wind Anisotropies instrument, which is on board SOHO. These are SOHO discoveries, and you can actually get credit for these. So SOHO is a spacecraft that is out there studying the sun day and night. Well, it just lives in orbit. It has no comprehension of day and night. As it sits the has the surrounding environment imagery. And the scientists studying the sun really don't care about all of these comets that are quite often taking a dive into the sun, like fireflies, not fireflies, like mosquitoes having a bad day. Now, these comets, all these images get posted online, and there are people out there who have written software to download all these images, process them looking for comets, and then they report them. And so there was a regular everyday amateur astronomer, Michael Maziazzo, who is the human being, the amateur astronomer who got credit for C2020 F8 Swan, which all of us are currently enjoying the imagery from. So you can use space telescopes, it turns out, to discover comets as long as the data you're using is somebody else's trash. <laughs> right, right, right. And and in fact, Soho for the longest time was the most prolific comet hunter out there. It was just watching comets as they died. So it was like, exactly. found one, and I watched it die. What a horrible existence for a spacecraft to just watch <laughs> death after death after death. But but it was the most prolific comet hunter out there uh, if what it saw was just comets smashing into the sun. Tell me about yeah. the future then. What does the future hold for finding comets? Well, so the Northern Hemisphere, the story we've told, will remain true. But for those Southern Hemisphere objects, 
those objects that are going to be in the nighttime sky and visible to the the Vera Rubin Observatory with the LSST. Um, that telescope is going to be probing the entire sky every, I think it's four nights. Yeah, four like, nights. Yeah. And it's going to be finding objects down to 20 plus magnitudes. <laughs> so now, like, just I, for, I've, give, give people comparison. Like, how faint is that? Oh, man. So, on a 30 inch telescope, you can hit 20th magnitude in V with a reasonably fast instrument right. in like 20 minutes. Right. And you have to process the bejesus out of that image. You have to have the best bias images, the best dark right. images, the best flat frames. Right. And you can see those 20th magnitude objects are there, but you may not want to use your data until you take a few more frames. Right, because it's fuzzy wuzzy, blurry worry. It's not good. While while Vera Rubin is going to crank that out fast. Six Sigma, no big deal. Yeah. Entire sky. Yeah. And so, and so suddenly <sighs> every comet hunting instrument out there is going to have to take a back seat to the mighty power of the Vera Rubin Observatory. In the Southern in Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, exactly. So, so Northern Hemisphere people still have hope. Yeah, but Vera Rubin's going to be finding all, it's going to be taking all your supernova lunch, it's going to be finding all your comets, all your asteroids, all your planet nines, it's going to be seeing everything that it can see, and it's going to report them first. And so, in, you know, any amateur uh, astronomers living in the Southern Hemisphere, may want to take on database programming as a <laughs> as a second job to uh to start grinding through your Rubin uh, uh data to try and find those comets in addition to their to their work and and the thing about lsst is it can find things but it can't necessarily follow up on things because it's a massive telescope and if it happens to find something that gets bright it can't deal it will be blinded by your average asteroid. Um, unfortunately, it will also be blinded, blinded by your average Starlink, but that's a different episode. Right, yeah, every, every, um, every frame will have a Starlink going through it. Unfortunately, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but there's going to be so much opportunity for amateur astronomers to instead of necessarily getting the naming rights to instead get their names on the research papers by following up on yeah. the things that LSST finds. So I think the future of Southern Hemisphere amateur astronomy observationally is going to change, but it's going to get in some ways much more necessary because we're going to have so many things to follow up on. Uh, at the same time, yeah, Northern Hemisphere, we just don't have uh, the amazing telescopes built a little bit of a combination of nothing as good as the Atacama Desert and nowhere as uh, unlight polluted yeah. as the Atacama Desert. Closest we get is Hawaii, and you can only build so many telescopes up there. Literally, it's legislated that way. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> uh, but I'm I, I, someday I hope we'll have something like Vera Rubin in the Northern Hemisphere, and I'm sure it's inevitable. Like if it does start to to dump all this data and make all these discoveries, then we'll see a northern one, maybe in the Canary Islands, or maybe, you know, somewhere like that. And then we will see the the Northern Hemisphere covered as well as the Southern Hemisphere, and and then it, it really well, might be a time to go and uh, you know get into database programming. So more to the point. When when I was still a college student, we thought a four meter telescope was something amazing. And people are now throwing out four meter telescopes, basically saying we can't afford to manage this. Does someone want to like yeah. take over our telescope? Yeah. As we get to the point that we're building these tens of meter telescopes, the six and eight meter telescopes. Yes. Are gonna start they're going to become dust. right. So hopefully someday one of the existing massive multimeter scopes can get turned into something with the instrumentation that LSST yeah. has. So instead of building a whole new telescope, let's just throw all the cameras on it. Yeah. And build the automation into the telescope itself. So it can, right. it can go fast. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think the, uh, I mean, th the Vera Rubin is an eight meter class telescope. It just has a ridiculously fast mount, ridiculously fast camera and 
mountains, I think like one of the biggest sensors ever built on a telescope. Have I mentioned how much I'm looking forward to this telescope? I'm looking yes. forward to this telescope. Yes. Well, okay. So if you want to get your name on an, on a comet, we hopefully we've given you some guidelines and now you can uh, get out there, observe, get your name on a comet. Let us know if it works out for you. Uh, and we will we will celebrate your discovered comet, except for the one that's going to be hitting Earth. You know. Yeah, you don't want to. You don't want your that name one. on that one. Pamela, yeah. speaking of names, do you have any names for us this week? I do. As always, we are here thanks to the generous contributions of people like you. Your everything allows us to pay our humans. In this case, Beth Johnson and Ali Pelfrey. Um, and Richard Drum to do our video editing, our audio editing, and create all the content that goes up on our websites. And um, we, we are grateful that you let us do this. And we would like to thank our patrons at patreon.com slash astronomycast. We can't thank you all in one week, so here is this week's running selection. Sarah Turnbull, G4184, Dean McDonald, Jillian Rhodes, Dana Nori, Roland Warmerdam, Paul Disney, Antisor? Antisor. Uh, Don Donald Mundus, Jason Graham, Andrew Stevenson, William Jones, Father Prax, Scott Bieber, Bart Flaherty, Russell Petto, Kenneth Ryan, Samansky, Glenn McDavid, Matthias Hayden, Dan Littman, Dean, Benjamin Davies, and Nalia. Thank you all for being here as our supporters. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you all next week. And now we save. And now we save. That was 570. Yep. Thanks to having the Astronomy Cast YouTube open, I was able to read it off the screen. Okay. Okay, we've got a few minutes um, to answer some questions about. Uh, about and the I want to explain. I want to apologize to the Twitch viewers that I I didn't realize fast enough that every time I went to adjust my lighting, I was eating the corner of the YouTube screen capture. Um, so you got to see all my lighting sets. Settings. We had a couple of of like garbly garbly drop. Okay. Drop data. So I don't know whether you're uploading something or whether you're you're streaming out something from your side, but it 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 did gobble up your just data. now. Um, during the episode, there was a couple of moments where you hung and and went robot and then came back. Okay. Yeah. Um, Arjone asks, are there common shapes for comets? Do we know how those shapes occur? Okay, hold on. I need to pause my sink because I forgot I had that turned on. Is that, um, that, you, would that, was that doing it then maybe? Just now, yes, okay. I had Dropbox. Um, so could you repeat the question? I'm so sorry. Are there common shapes for comets? Do we know how those shapes occur? We, we don't know yet. We've only been able to see the inner core of a few comets. In general, we just see a fuzzy blob. And when we discovered that Cherry Geary was shaped like a rubber duck, first of all, we were delighted. Second of all, we were confused. Right. Um, and, and I think there's some pretty good models for how that happens. But uh, we have no idea what are the common. We know some of the possible big ideas of you have something roughly sphere sphere shaped you have a essentially a pile of ice and you have two round things that have merged together right right and, and i think from what i understand you've got like you know two objects maybe they were broken up at some point yeah and a then contact they, binary and then they're orbiting around each other as it gets slower and closer and closer and then they just kiss and now yes. they're just they're just spinning around like a peanut. Um, yeah. But you can imagine how that might happen, right? Where you get some impact, the thing gets broken apart into a spray, and then the sprays collect into pieces, and the pieces collect into pieces, and you get them all kind of coming back together. Um, for taking photos, this comes from the half blind astronomer. For taking those photos, is there an optical type, optimal type of scope, lens, camera settings, etc.? 
you you want basically as large a field of view and as fast a camera as you can get. Uh, what's kind of ideal is what's called a prime focus yeah. camera. And this is something that you can modify. Uh, Schmidt, Schmidt Casses are pretty okay for modifying to do this. Well, you can just you, buy them off the shelf now. So the, the Rasa, the, the, the Rasa oh, yeah, from Celestron is, yeah. is a good example of a, you know, the Rasa that I'm using is a 2.5, 2.2, and F2.2. That's your F ratio. Yeah. So it's very fast. Yeah. Right? Um, or there's the Hyperstar that is a modified Celestron or you can, and I mean, they, they bolt the camera onto the front of the telescope. Yeah. And so instead of getting the multiple bounces, you just get one bounce off the mirror and right into the camera. No eyepiece. Yeah. You can't look through right. the telescope. But it does give you that larger field of view and much faster sensitivity. So when I was talking about studying 20, 20th magnitude stars with the 30 inch, you better believe I was using a prime focus camera. Yeah. And, and so I think you've got to decide, right? Are you going to try to do this with your eye? Are you going to get, are you going to learn the night sky so well that you can just through memory look at place after place, which is, you know, there's a, there's a still an art form to that entirely. There's plenty of people. Um, Richard is talking about some people in the, um, in the chat who are capable of just with their own eyeballs being able to memorize the night sky and be able to move from object to object. There's a, I know there's a, there's a supernova uh, finder out of Australia who does that. Just looks at as many galaxies as he can. Yeah, night after that's, night after that's night. That's the Reverend Bob Evans. That's right. He's, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and he's just, amazing. And so you can go that route if you want to still be able to have an eyepiece that you can look through. Plan B is and you just have you have the the locations of of every part of the sky the key is that you have to look at galaxies and you go like okay yeah i know that there are four bright stars in this galaxy nope i don't see it okay next galaxy right but with comets you can be looking anywhere and so you're literally just scanning bit by bit by bit and go are there any blurry bits yes is that a blurry bit that's already been identified no well, and if you want to get fancy pants, you look at fields that contain relatively nearby galaxies that are on the sky, not too far out of the plane, but are out of the plane. And you double dip looking both for comets right. and for supernovae. Right. Um, but there's a lot of space prettier. that has no, no, no galaxies in it that could have a comet in it. So, um, uh, Nancy is asking, how are there any minimum specifications for someone set up to be qualified for and be assigned an, an observatory code by the official organization? So do you know what it takes to? Yeah. So it's not your setup that matters so much as your ability to use it, which is a metaphor for so many things. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so what they'll do, uh, you have to test yourself out by taking images of um, known objects, and this is all written up on the Minor Planet Center's website. You take images of known objects and submit the astrometry and prove that you can pull this off. So you test yourself out, you submit data, you show them that you know how to do the process, and then they grant you an observatory code. It's, it's a little more complex than that, but that's basically what it is. Um, go check out their website. They're super straightforward to work with, and things are as automated as they possibly can be. Uh, Unc Willie is asking, will Swan be the great comet of 2020? No. No? No. It's it's already at its closest, and if it was going to be the great comet of 2020, uh, people would be more excited. Yeah. It had a fabulous outburst last week, and the detailed images that folks have gotten of its tail are breathtaking go check out the astronomy picture of the day of comet yeah. swan if you haven't already um but it's not going to become a readily visible in both hemispheres unaided eye object it's going to get lost in the twilight of our northern yeah um yeah northern it's skies. i mean to get one of those really bright visible comets you need a bunch of things to happen right yeah you need you need the comet to get close to the sun to get really blasted hard by this by the radiation so that it produces yeah. a really bright tail and then it has to make a close flyby of the earth so that Pre it, preferably in that order 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. First, first hit by first close to the sun, but not torn apart, which was right. what happened with um, Atlas. The Atlas, and there was no the one that was Borisov. No, like twenty years ago. No, like ten years ago. Like eight years ago. Oh, I, uh, I, uh, Ison, Comet Ison. I, I, yes. Yeah, we were waiting. Ison was going to be the great one. And Thanksgiving it, Day. Yeah, and it, it didn't make it past the sun. So, so close, but not too close, so that yeah. you do flare up, and then you make that flyby close to the Earth. Again, not too close. Um, right. Although. You know, there have been cometary passes that have passed through the upper atmosphere in the past. So so I'm fine with in the troposphere. The the 1888 <laughs> meteor shower they had that inspired the song Stars Fall on Alabama. Uh, you could read the newspaper by the constant flux of yeah. shooting stars yeah that i want that meteor yes please storm. yeah so and when you think about say uh hail bop or hayakutake they came let's see, let's see how, how close hayakutake came um that's what you need is you want that close you want that close flyby of the earth after a close flyby of the sun without it just getting destroyed right one of the closest cometary approaches in 200 years so it got within, oh, I'm trying to find the data. If anyone knows how close Hayakutake got. It was um, about 30 degrees tip to tail yeah, in the sky. Yeah, it, was, it, was it was amazing. Stunning. No, I don't see a distance for its closest approach. Point one. 0.1 AU. Okay, so so 0.1 AU. AU is 150 million kilometers. So it got within 1.5 million kilometers. No, 50 so that, million kilometers of of. So that's a hundred times Earth. the distance to the moon ish. Yeah, I mean the moon is 400,000 kilometers away. So times 10 would be 4 million. So no, it would be, it would be five times away from the moon wow i missed math for that okay yeah yeah it was close it was very close yeah and so that's what you need for it to be one of these really bright visible comets we've reached the end of our hour uh so time to wrap things up uh thank you everyone for watching us today really appreciate your support thanks for everyone who gave us a like uh that means a lot <laughs> to us as well likes are how we gain energy um I think every time you get a like that puts money in your bank account, I'm not sure how this works. Um, but thank you for everyone watching us on Twitch as well. Uh, we know you're there. Uh, we we can see sense, you. We see you. We sense your psychic presence. Uh, thanks to our <laughs> moderators. Thanks to Nancy Graziano and uh, Richard Drum and everyone else who joins us every week. Like I said, next thing for me, Sunday morning, Sir Martin Reese. Yeah, that you're going to want to see this is interview. Amazing. Yeah, I know. Amazing. I know. And next week, the Daily Space will be back in full force at 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, Monday through Friday on twitch.tv slash X. And another star party Sunday night. So if you want to see more of these pictures, you want to come and watch us fail to discover a supernova or a comet, join us <laughs> and watch us as we hilariously bumble around the night sky. I you're going to be so shocked when you someday actually discover <laughs> something and don't quite know what to do. I know. I can't wait. I'm ready. All right. I'm thanks, ready everybody. Thanks, Pamela. And we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>